all this, all these lights, all these lights are uh, uh, incandescent lamps. And which camera now, right? And they're. You see, they got like a little driver. There's like a, a transistorized circuit that converts the bulb, you know, to light these lamps. Now, each one of these lamps is showing the status of a bit in, in a particular register of the computer. But they're more than that. They're also switches. Every one of these is a switch. So, for example, if I was to push that button in, it would set bit 12 in this CE register. And what these are, this is the, op, the odd channels, and this is the even channel, that's why it's E and O. Then each one of these channels, we have like seven channels here, and again, seven on here, so a total of 16 channels. Like he said, this is a special tool that comes with, well, actually it's stored, there's one stored over here on the door. And this is a card extractor for the uh, memory cards. But I'll open this up so you can see what's going on inside. So you can see all the cards. Each individual card, there's a color code on here. Each card has a of course, a number, a part number. They're, uh, they're mostly different. There's a lot of the same cars. Like, for example, these two, this chassis is an I.O. chassis. So most of the cars are drivers for the, there's like 16. So it's easy to replace with those. Well, this is one of the problems with this being on the wrong side. That this, this chassis really belongs over here, and this one belongs over there. But so it's open in the wrong way. But if you can see back here, you can see all the wire wrap. I want to look at it. Get out of the way. Yeah, we just wanted, I'm taking advantage of the fact that you had everything opened up. Yeah, oh yeah. This is really cool. So it's all wire out there. There's probably 1,500 cards in here. And they're all uh, germanium transistors. Which is just lights that give you status information. They're also buttons too. Close this one up. Well, this is the memory chassis. So each one of these blocks here is 4K of memory, core memory. And these are the driver cards for the cores. And this tool here on the door is for pulling these cards out. It's got two little pins that go right into two little holes on the card and you squeeze it like. So this is 32K of memory right here. There's more on the other side, but there's only uh, two cores on that one. That's all. I guess we can put the turn power on to see if it works. We haven't. All right. Let me check my switches. That provides 400 cycle power, three phase delta for the computer. So, this is the uh, program counter here. So, I'm going to set that to 5600. We do everything's done in octal on this computer. Yeah. And the lights are grouped. Three silver ones, three black ones. The rings around the mounting rings. That's so you can keep track of the... Uh... Now I should just see. That's good, I got a three stop. 
Now, what that's done is it stopped at a location and showing me the value, a certain memory location in the AU and AL register. That's given me an opportunity to change those to something else. Each time I do it, it's a different one. Like, for example, this one, this is the amount of memory we have. Okay. And that like is... diagnostic, like the biosecurity? Well, you're setting it up. It's, it's a, the diagnostic program will run on a 16-channel or an 8-channel machine. It'll, it'll run on one with a 16K or 32K in memory. You have to tell it what you're going to do. And this is just telling you what channels you're using for the 7 and whatever. I can't remember what the hell. So now I'm going to put this switch down and it should run. And what it should do, it should go through a, a test where it tests every instruction first. Then it'll test every memory location that you just told it about. And then it'll check all the I.O. channels to make sure that they're working. And it should run six times and it takes about 60 or 80 seconds to run. But usually it, it doesn't run that long because we have, it's an old machine. This, this hasn't been on in over a year. So here we go. So you can see it's actually running a program. I got a five stop. Now a five stop is an error. Something is wrong. So what you would do here is you would record the value of the P register, record the value in the AU and AL register, and this C E register. I have a book and I have to go into a book and I, that'll give you uh, suggestions as to what cards could be bad. It, it's actually Somebody went and made this book that uh, they know how the program worked. They know what it's tested and what didn't work. Yeah. And from these, these are clues that help you find out what's wrong. Yeah. And of course, I, I, I could do it, but I need room to, to do that. The other thing you could do is start over. Yeah. You know. But what I want to do is, well, see if it has, see if we get the same stop again. Because core memory, again, it's still there. Now, there can be faults such that it will eat up the memory and then your program won't run anymore. Then you have to reload it. So, when the, when the uh, people here are out of the way, I'll get the, my log book and I'll write this down. We've been keeping a log book since the first time we turned it on. Every group? Yeah. Well, every day that we work on it. Not, not every individual booth, but. But whenever we get like an error like this, we'll take that and we'll, we'll write it down, just so we know. Yeah. If that ever happens again, this computer has one problem in it affecting this I/O channel. Seven. We call it 17 because this is zero to seven. This is 10 to uh, 17. Yeah, it's not even lit up. It's even well, no, I hadn't done the I/O yet. It failed. It looks like it failed in memory, probably. I don't know what what instruction failed. Let me get a. My book. Anyway, so that's, that's the values. Now, what you would do next, if you're really troubleshooting it, you get this book out here. <laughs> well, we're not going to really do it. I'm just showing you what you would do. 
in here that has all these different tables. Uh, table 814, 821. You have to know which table to go to. It's usually always the same one. But in the, in the procedure for running diagnostics, which is in here, it tells you what tables to go to and things like that, right? So I'm thinking 821 is her uh, eight. No, it's 819. Huh? I forget which table it was I go to first. I can't remember the table, but for, just for the sake of argument, we'll use this table. So you will look up the peak register, 23045. So you see it's going up in increments. So you just keep looking until you find. Well, I'm not finding it. I'm probably in the wrong table. I just said it's the right one. But the program itself is broken down into certain parts of the program are doing memory tests, certain parts are doing uh, you know, I.O. So the fact that it's in this particular bank of memory when it failed, you can know what it was actually doing. I'm not seeing the... We're getting there. Well, yeah, well that's really... I didn't, I, I didn't write the zero. Maybe I wrote it down wrong. I, I, I can go check. Let me just see if I find 23. I don't, I don't see one. Let me go, I might have read it wrong. Another thing is the bulb could be burned out on the uh, light. And then so, you don't even know. Right. So I have two, three, zero, four, five. Two, three, zero, four, five. So I wrote it down right. Well, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Zero, four, and five. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reset it and run it again like I would have, but at least I, have it, I do have it written down. So at least the program is still there. So that time you got a program fault. That means it got to an instruction that was not valid. That probably means I wiped out uh, the, the memory too. I'll try one more time. <laughs> so now we have to troubleshoot. Now you got to troubleshoot. Yeah, trace it out. Yeah. Or or reload the program. Back into the court. Yeah. Yeah. And do a little thing. Now, no, uh, yeah, well, it's a fairly big tape, but uh, the first thing you have to do is make sure this. See this switch here. Uh, yeah. This one here, NDRO. NRO. Yeah, NDRO. That's not destructive readout. Uh, and this is main memory. Main memory. So, I the, see. so there's a ROM, there's a a, a a core rope memory in there. Yeah. And it has a bootstrap program yeah. in it. But that bootstrap program has the code for loading the, the magnetic tape version of yeah. software. 
Yeah. If you want to load anything else, you have to put this down in the main memory and, and manually load the program into main memory. So then you can bootstrap yourself up. Yeah. yeah. This is the program we use. Well, I have two copies here for paper tape boot. So I have to make sure that's in, the, uh, in memory. Yeah. The trouble is I forget how to do it. <laughs> so what you do is you take there's a, a thing here a uh, function repeat switch. If I put that switch up, it'll just constantly do the same instruction over and over, over and over. So you put an instruction in here a function code that you want to do over and over. So you want to put in a read memory uh, instruction. I, and to be honest, I'm forgetting. I think it's 10. So I put 10 in here. Put this up. Set the P register where you want to look at, say 500, which is where the uh, main memory of that bootstrap program is. Then each time I push this, it should, it should, uh, I'm not sure if I have to put it in a single step or not. I can't remember if I have to do that. Let me just see what happens when I push that. I can't do that. It has to be in a single step. Hopefully that wasn't a right code because if it did, it completely erased all memory. Uh, I can't remember. I forget how to do it. Up step. Uh, yeah, sequence step, IO clear. Oh, I gotta put it right here. I gotta put this in off step. I forgot. Okay. Yeah, it's run. These are the run mode. Yeah. Okay. Now I put my, I have my 10 in here. Now each time I hit this, it should just do one off step. You see how the, although that's, apparently 10 isn't right because I should have had code in it. I have to look, up, I have to look it up again. Like I said, it's been too long for me, I forget. I know, it's a whole year. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was 10. That's to clear, function repeat, up step. 500. Okay, so there's one. All right, so that's working there. So what that's doing is that's reading out the value in, in the, that boot. In the NDRO program, right? Yeah. See how it's changing. All right, so now I reset it. I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to put this down to main, to main memory. Now when I read it out, I should get these numbers. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I'm at five two five oh two, isn't it? Five zero oh two. And that should be for five oh seven two oh one. Five oh seven eight six I say, what did I say? Five oh seven two oh one. That's not, that's not right, is it? It's not right. Yeah. I, you got, I, I cannot do off on my head, so I'm relying on so you. I, so I have to... So that's relearn. gotten changed now. Something happened to it, yeah. Yeah. Now there's yeah, nothing. Yeah. Probably it got written to when I think when I did that fall. But you take the tape in and load it back. Right, no. No? You got to do put it, it in by hand? By hand. Oh, you got to put this in. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> And this is the a, lowest level bootstrap code you gotta Yeah. Make. Yeah. And what's hard, I, I always have trouble. There's one way of doing it right from here. But it, for some reason, you gotta, you gotta skip one of the addresses. I can't remember how I do it to get it synchronized with what we're, 
where this and this are matched. There's another way of doing it from down here on the bottom panel. And that's how I was doing it most recently. That's probably how I'm going to do it this time. But I'm going to have to get to the book and look yeah. it up because I can't remember how to do it. So anyway, in order to load the paper tape, first, like I said, we loaded the spoot strap yeah. into core memory with the switch down, so it's in main memory. Then we're going to master clear the computer. I have to have stop three and stop four up, and all other stops and sticks down. That's part of the procedure. And I'm going to put this on load, and when I hit start, it should access the tape job. But first, I've got to put the tape in and turn this on. So then we do the same thing on here, we master clear this. Here's my tape. This is a mylar tape, yeah, which, is, which is real forgiving on the tape jams. Not that on here. Make sure I get it in good. There it is. Okay, now you see it, right? Now I'm going to have to clear this again. This is supposed to catch all the tape. <laughs> it, of course, it's supposed to be empty. Yeah. But with all the crap we got in there. It's on so when I hit start, that should start loading that. And it did not. Okay, well, I know what's wrong, I think. It's not online. It's got to, I don't think it is, anyhow. It was offline. But now it should work. Now, while it's doing that, if you look over here, you'll see you see the register here incrementing. Well, only because the generator and the computer are so noisy. That's a fairly fast. I think it's 300 characters per second. Well, yeah, you can use it a lot of times. Yeah. And if it does jam up, it doesn't rip the tape. If it yeah, rips, yeah, yeah. then you're, you're screwed, you know? Yeah. So this is what they actually gave the sailors on the ships that had the Mylar tape. Now, when that loads, I should get a, I think I, I think I get a three stop. I can't remember what I was supposed to get. Uh, It should get three with the program counter stopped at 710. All right. That's how you know it's a good load. Okay, so stop three. The program counter is seven. One zero for so seven ten. Right. So that means you got a good load. Check some and all that was good. Now we would go through like a, the last time around diagnostics. You have to input these values, make sure you have the ones you want for which challenge you're going to test and that's it. But the first thing you want to do, I'm going to put this switch up to protect that yeah. protect that memory so yeah. I don't uh, yeah. get it. But then I'm going to rewind the tape.
need to rewind it. Rewind it. You rewind it. So it's tighter right now. Yeah. But in order to rewind it, I'd probably have to reload it or something to get it. Yeah, on all You know, so let's leave it like that for now. Yeah. The other thing is when you run diagnostics, this equipment has to be turned off. Oh, yeah? It won't pass. It. Well, because it sees it. This will answer it, but it checks the I.O. It'll yeah. see it. And, it'll, and it won't like it. it. Well, it just doesn't expect it. Yeah. So. So again, so now it starts at 5,600. I should get a stop three, which I get, and I have to load these values. I, I think the only value I really, I don't think I have to change any of these values because this is a 40K machine. Usually it's a 32K. When you get to uh, right here, you would have to, instead of 12, you put 10 for a 32K machine. But it's, but it's preloaded with uh, this in it. Yeah. And I fail we have before, I looked it up, it, it says it's a 651 card, which is one of the memory drivers. Yeah. So there's probably some kind of memory problem going on. But we're just going to run it and see what it does anyhow. Now this skip switch here, each, each switch, these are, there's a program instruction for each switch on here. And the way this program is written, when it checks the output uh, channels, it like loops back in, it goes out one channel, back in another channel to see if it's good. Yeah, yeah it'll loop back. Like right. But there's two ways of looping it back. One loop back is internal without a, without a cable on the outside. Yeah. And the other way is if you have a cable, a physical cable, and it's using the actual drivers and everything instead of just the registers. Yeah. Well, this switch controls that. So if I leave that switch up, it just loops back internally instead of going out the cable over and back in. So you, you kind of have to get it working this way first. Then you put the jumper yeah, yeah. on and run it. See if you get it done. Yeah. You go because, little steps. Yeah. So I'll just start it again and see what it does. I mean, it'll probably still fail, but... Well, see, it went through an I.O. That's the I.O. sequence there. Went, that's good. It should do that six times. I should get a four stop, and that means it passed diagnostics. And it takes 55 seconds to run through the whole. Yeah. That was the third, I think, wasn't it? Okay, four stop. four stop. And the program is at what? Uh, five, zero, five, two. So I have to look that up. I think that's the right number. It just means it's, it's, fi it's finished. It passed every instruction that it does and ran through everything four times or six times. And it's good. It's 100%. That's what they're saying right now. Now, of course. There's a lot of other functions of the computer that aren't being tested. Like we have like this inner computer channel. We have uh, single or double density output. Like no, this is 18-bit computer. So if I was talking with another one of these, I would just be straight 18-bit. But with two computers talking to each other, which one's the peripheral? Neither one. So so you have to tell it it's inner computer. There's a, so it tells you whether it's an inner computer channel or not. Yeah, right. That goes back up. Right. That that tells it. Yeah. That. The handshaking is different now. Yes. And the same way with these here. Now, if I was to uh, say I wanted to talk to a computer, a 36-bit computer somewhere, well, what it would do is it would take two channels and alternate them into one 36-bit cable. Yeah. And then that way it could send 36-bit words back and forth from the other computer. Cool. It, it can really do so it. They have a lot of interoperability of the Yeah. And of course, there's a, there's also a, like an interrupt priority type of a thing. 
The highest channel number is the highest price. The channel 17, this one is the highest of all, and zero is the lowest. So zero, is, that's why zero is on the teletype. Who cares if they would touch anything now? You know what I mean? It's kind of, it's kind of used something like your car computer, like it's like an embedded computer in the system. Yeah. You load an operational program, and that program is just sitting there waiting for inputs. Do they get an input from uh, the, the Navy Tactical Data System or TBS? Yeah. If that comes in and says, hey, we want to uh, do something with System 2 or System 3, whatever system you are, then it would it would do that, whatever it said to do. It would say, take the radar, put it at a certain place in space. Then the radar would look for that target. If it's not a target, it would send it back up to NTDS, and they would know that they got... Yeah, it's the like the orchestrator for all these things. Right. Plus, and you can program it so they can make it work with a whole bunch of different stuff. Well, and you can change it at, with time. Yeah. See, these all replaced. The original computers were a 12... This is a 1219. It's, it's odd that the other one... I ended in 1902, but I can't remember the number, but it was analog computer. Uh, yeah. So everything, like, in the physical world, we use synchros a lot for telling a uh, shaft position. So like if an antenna is pointing here, three, or it's pointing here, they usually, they send three wires down, that, the, and the phase reference of each three wire tells you where that yeah. thing is, right? Yeah, in space. Right. So the first, yeah. So one of the first inputs is coming in. You have the gyroscope. Yeah. And the ship's gyro has wall, pitch, and yaw. Yeah. So all those inputs are coming into the computer. Hey, right. Then, then we have. It's moving. It's keeping the gun. Right? Well, it's just telling you where it's just moving at. It yeah. ain't doing anything yet. Then the uh, missile launcher has synchros that tell where it's pointing. So it knows where the launcher is. It knows where the gyro is. It knows where the radar is. Okay. And when you send a command to it, you might tell the radar to go to a certain place. Well, then you look at where the radar is. Say I told it to go to 360, and it's saying it's 120. Well, it waits till it gets that one, that 360. Then it, it, it reads it, it knows it got there, it knows it's done. You know what I mean? But it'll use a certain channel for talking to the radar. Another channel. Well, it's actually a little, a little different than that. On the analog computer, it was all hardwired. Everything happened. But when they decided to get to the digital computer, nobody thought it was going to work. At least, I should say nobody, but they wouldn't have done it. Yeah. But all the old people didn't want it. They didn't want anything to do with this. What we got perfect, you know? So they had to build a digital analog converter to convert all this synchro input data in. And when we send synchro words out, they have to go out. They wanted the computer to be able to be put on the ship don't change anything else. I'm not changing the launch, I'm not changing I'm not changing this. Just leave it alone. So what they've come up with is this right here. Yeah, I was looking at that. This is the signal data converter. Oh, okay. Okay, this is Mark 75 mod zero. Every missile system has its own SDC and it's a different one. But this is designed for Terra. There's another one designed for Tartar. There's another one designed for Talos. And this does, it does digital interface. Also, one of these is a DDTU, that's Digital Data Transfer Unit. That, instead of using the inner computer or the double channel thing, it talks to this as a single channel, then this does a, a conversion for, for the NTS people. All of our, uh, let's see, this channel here is all of our synchros. What, what they have, they have DC inputs, like DC buses, like it used to be in the old analog computer, like say uh, you get radar lap on. Well, that would light a light, says radar lap on. Yeah. Well, with a 50 volt signal, they'll lit that. So now the 50 volt signal has to come into this unit, convert it to a certain bit and a certain word, and then the computer, and and the computer knows that that light is lit because or that function happens. So do you power this up ever? I haven't fired. We haven't fired it up yet. I'd like yeah. to fire it up. Yeah. I don't have it hooked up. I'm. We got the army. They got to be a radar system. We can get from somewhere on that camp and hook it up. Up yeah. there on the front, looks like there's a radar. Yeah, well, it, it, they're unbelievably complex. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. The, the, ra the radar, the radar antenna alone is like uh, eight, 
10 tons. Oh, and the, and the power? And the, and, the, and the radar cabinets, like they have cabinets that are, say, basically the same size as this. Yeah. Two systems would have maybe 36 cabinets as far as the radar, you know. That's just the radar, and the launcher has its own stuff. Everything is huge. Yeah. The point is, though, that all the, they call them buses, on target, launcher sign, missile in flight, uh, any of that kind of stuff, comes in as a 50 volt signal, and this converts it to a word, a digital word. And we can look at those words here on, this, on these uh, LEDs. And here also, we have, uh, well, these are Apple words, but you can look at, by putting the right address in, you would be able to select a, select a different word that you're sending and what the bits in that word were. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, there's a, there was a program called SDC PIT, with a peripheral interface test, and the computer would run the program, yeah. and this has end around, uh, I don't know if I have any cards handy to show you, but as these big cross point switches where every output would be connected to its input by picking up like a, a hundred pin relay kind of thing, you know what I mean? And so the computer would tell it to output a word, a synchro data, that would be switched over to an input, and the input would be converted back to and digital, and the computer would read it and see if it's in tolerance or not. Yeah, okay, so it checked itself. So it was tested by the computer, yeah. <laughs> it was a program. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try something with. Awesome. Well, it's kind of funny. Like one thing I didn't mention was the computer, the comp all the equipment has more than one name, right? <clears throat> like you can see on here, this, uh, this is a UNIVAC, a UNIVAC 1532 I.O. console. Well, we never call it that. This is a Mark 77 I.O. console to us. A Mark 77? Yes, yeah. because that's what it was called on the ship. Uh, Everything in fire control has a Mark and a Mod. It's just the way they do it. I think they're trying to confuse you from, uh, so, the enemy, so to speak, doesn't know what you're talking about. Right, because it's universal. <coughs> you might yeah. upgrade this, but you still call it Mark 8. No, we, we would call something else. You would call something else. So the point is, if you, and another name for this is the OA 7989, 7984. I can't remember exactly. But that's the number that the uh, computer, not computer, the electronics people on the ship would use. So they have the electronics name, they have the, the weapons name, and then you have the commercial name. So yeah. this has three names. Now, this particular one, the Mark 77, used a Teletype Model 35 printer, teleprinter on it. There was a concept called a Mark 95 one, and it used the Kleinschmidt on that one. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but it wasn't this Kleinschmidt, it was, it kind of looked more like this console with a Kleinschmidt sitting on top that had a keyboard with it. And right here, it had the paper tape, but it also had magnetic tape. It had Little uh, Phillips cassettes for the regular like, you audio cassettes. Yeah, really? You load your operation program with audio cassettes. Because they didn't have this big. Yeah. They, those ships are smaller ships, and it's a smaller range missile. They didn't have the physical space to put all that stuff. <coughs> so it's on this other console, yeah. right. That's where I originally got this Kleinschmidt printer because. It was same. It looked the same as the printer that was on the Mark yeah. 95, even though it doesn't have the keyboard. Yeah. <clears throat> Who knows? If you get the channels right, you might be able to type on this and have an output on that. You you could Depending you uh, you could do that. You'd have to write a program yeah, to do right. that. Yeah. Uh, and Dwayne can do that. He's the. Yeah. Yeah. He's the man. Uh, the typing and the printing are <clears throat> different. Yeah. And the on that. yeah. And. Uh, I guess I showed you this device that Wayne had made before, the Arduino interface. Yeah, your little uh, adapter. Yeah, now what we would do with that is, this lets us load some of those other programs. Very quickly. Put, give it a different channel, put it on channel three, say. Yeah. And then I could use a, a laptop computer to load in a program. Now we've yeah. actually copied diagnostics over to one of those channels too. I remember you got from here last year for the week. <coughs> 
Yeah. But it's but it gets confusing. And then the thing is, like, we turned this on and it, it didn't work, right? Yeah. It failed. I don't, now it just passed 100 <laughs> percent. So that stuff happens. So now it's working good. So we decide, okay, we're going to do something. And we start doing it. Then all of a sudden it don't work again. And you don't know if you're doing something wrong with your little box, your program, or with the computer screwed up, you know? See it. But, uh, uh, maybe. Who knows? No, I, I can't do it under computer control, though. Yeah. I can just do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is how it's going to do it. Well, the head is over here. Okay. This is a vacuum chamber. When I turn it on, vacuum will pull this tape. And it should cover, I think, three of these holes, and the other two should be okay. It's like slot, right? Right. And these motors on here. Are controlled by this lever arm. There's like a, there's a pot, there's a. Well, I can open this door and show you. See up here, there's a pot right here. A 10 turn pot. Well, not a 10 turn, a, a precision pot, a 10K pot. <clears throat> and what it does is like, there's negative 15 on one side and positive 15 on the other. So the, uh, the, where you move the arm is what DC voltage. That's the back. That's the back. So where you move this arm, it gives the voltage, and that'll control this motor here, this this motor and this motor. <coughs> this is for the cap stand to move the tape at a constant speed. But this is just to get rid of slack. And you don't want it. Uh, <coughs> It moves the tape, reads the tape at 120 inches a second, see? And it can stop in a millisecond. So you don't want to stop real sudden, stretch the tape. So they have to have all this buffering to get rid of it. So now if I put this in, let's see. Sec channel one, okay. And then it. So you can see now it's like, uh, I can't turn that any further because the motor's fighting me. And I can go forward here and it should go fast forward. But it's not fast forward, normal forward. Right? Stop. And as I do want it. So what it is, the tape has a, a little reflective the tape on there, and when it goes past this light, it reflects off that tape. That's the start and stop sensor. So the beginning of the tape has is one, and all the way back at the end of the 2400 feet is another one. So, and of course, that's on a different side of the tape. That's the other tape, and this is the beginning of the tape. That's really about all I can show you on this without the. Uh, you can do some of the same things I just did by punching words into the register here, right? I could, uh, I could tell the computer to access it, so it won't be able to read it, though, because I don't want to ruin the copy of diagnostic I just wrote it. You know what I mean? So, that's pretty much all I can really do. So let me show you these when it's, when it's running. You see how this is? Yeah. That's spinning the cap stand. And when you want when I tell it to go, what happens is the pinch roller squeezes the tape onto this cap stand. There's one for forward and one for reverse. And whichever whichever pinch roller you tell it to energize, it does it. So all these are just reacting to the to the position of his arm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's moving the thing back. Right. The, as soon as this starts taking tape out of this arm, this right. arm moves, this motor will just Super energized And of course, the tape in here now is, is back yeah. here like that. Right. Now we have a uh, 
a clear plastic door for diagnostics that we can put yeah, on there. Yeah, video with the big IBM Yeah. yeah, well they don't have, they don't have any of the mechanical, but it's all that. Yeah. This is a combination of two. Yeah. Well, it's pretty neat, really. And the way this, is, this thing can handle, we only have two handlers on it. This can handle, I think, up to eight handlers. And I just put another cabinet and that's where they plug, they all plug in. And you see the switches here. I, I address, I can tell that oh, yeah. I have this as address one, I have this as address two. So if the computer wants to load a tape from a certain address, it, it knows what address to ask for. Do they just have to take programs on it, or do they keep data? <coughs> they do both. It depends on what you're doing. Like, storing an actual, say, missile shooter test, yeah. they put tapes on here, and everything that the computer is doing is a, uh, oh, yeah. It, it just saves it all on tape. There's another program, a data reduction program, to analyze the tape. Yeah. The tape. So say you shot the missile and uh, and the missile blew up halfway before it got there. Yeah. What the hell was that? What happened? You know? So you can get back here and say, oh, well, the radar never did this. Or the launcher never did this. Or, you know, because it's not saved. You know? So now you know where to look at for the trouble. This is what Dwayne and I want to work on. That's what we. This is what we want to concentrate on on our next uh, visit. Yeah. You were last year too, yeah. Yeah. Well, we got a lot done, and we found a lot of problems in here in the in the lot control lot, which we solved. But there's only so much time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like on a ship, when you put this on the ship, you might have three or four months to work on it before it has to be ready. You know what I mean? Plus, wherever it came from, it already worked when it was sent to you. Yeah. But during shipping and installation and handling, things happen. And, you know. We got all new light bulbs over there. They all work. <laughs> and these are the same light bulbs again as that. And on the front there. The, yeah. The, I think a 344 lamp is what it is. Yeah. And like I said, I found out that diagnostics, well, I knew it, but I forgot. Yeah. Has a built in, some built in programs that uh, it's called Z Pack. Z Pack? Z Pack, P A C. Oh, it's a, the computers, are, when you get them, they give you a program called U Pack. It's a universal program, uh, oh. utility program. It lets you read and write paper tapes and. Uh, yeah. There's, you there's a lot of things you can do. Yes, when you're troubleshooting and work, just doing stuff. But there's one built into this program at yeah. 6,000. And that's what I was using to, that's what I used to load this. So anyway. Uh, so now I have to think about how we can make something print out. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'll load uh, some other program. This doesn't belong on the computer. No, but I'm saying, does it have any printout, you know, of its own, where it'll show anything? Oh, no, build in, no. No. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to get it to type.